in the jacket of yes. uh, your book, The Auroras, uh, published by HarperCollins in 2012, uh, we can read that you are a poet of wild imagination. Are you a poet of wild imagination or of wild perception? Everything in my poems is invented, even those things that are real. The dilemma is always, in any emotionally fraught situation, we have this allegiance to what happened, to the details. And that makes it a kind of diary for us. But it doesn't necessarily engage the reader, unless you can pull the reader into the fabric of the poem, through the music of the language, through the sense of the psychological complexity, then it's not going to feel like an experience. Every poem is an experience, as much as an experience is an experience. Any piece of art, if you look at a painting, if you go to a movie, you go to the ballet, it's an experience. What a writer has to do, what a poet has to do, is to create an experience for the reader. And you want that to be an experience of the poet's mind at work. Every poem is a piece of consciousness that it's enacted in language. Because we're writers, we do it in language. If we were painters, we would do it in a different way. So I think of myself as uh, a poet of real invention, but also a poet faithful to the emotional terrain. And for me, you know, all my poems are figured against a kind of psychosexual landscape. They're often, they often deal with uh, two people, a speaker and a you. The dynamic of what happens in relationships seems to me the single most potent way to allow a reader to experience the dynamic of whatever the concern is. Maybe it's a certain kind of loss. Maybe it's displacement. Maybe it's a you know, failed hope. I mean, maybe you know, it's actual love. I mean, Donald Hall has this little phrase where he says, the happy poem sleeps in the sun. And so the hardest thing to write is a poem of ease and contentment. Yeah. So especially when I'm trying to write something, let's say a little longer, that's not a page poem, maybe you know three pages, then I want to have the poem really travel in a way, from ease to tension to ease. And that has to be experiential. For me, the Thing poems are most like are like film, like cinema. Yeah. You have at least 10 books of poetry, most recently The Face, a novella in verse, The Auroras, uh, The Window. You also have a volume of essays, mm -hmm. uh, Where the Angels Come Toward Us. You're also the co-editor of the uh, an anthology mm -hmm. of the hybrid, the, the hybrid uh, Northern Anthology of New Poetry. And um, so you are a very accomplished poet, but what was the first contact or your first discovery of poetry? I grew up in a house with books, and my grandfather actually was an English professor and a dean of humanities in Fresno, where I grew up. Mm -hmm. But my father was a jock, and he was a coach, and he was a tennis player, and I was raised to be a tennis player. I played really seriously when I was young. But I quit playing seriously when I was about 15. I'd already played against some really great world-class players. And right about that time, I started playing in rock and roll bands. And that was really an important shift for me. But the first time I remember being stunned by poetry I was at my grandmother's house. She had on her table an issue of The Atlantic. And I think I was maybe seven. And in that issue of The Atlantic, 
was an article about Dylan Thomas. Mm -hmm. And I started reading these poems by Dylan Thomas, and I didn't know words could do those kinds of things. And it was a complete and absolute revelation to me. When I was uh, a sophomore in high school, I was having dinner with my speech coach and his wife, and he had the Cadman records of T.S. Eliot. And he started playing these you know, early recordings of Eliot, mm -hmm. reading those poems and, and reading um, Proof Rock and then reading The Wasteland. And that was the Dylan Thomas and hearing the voice of Eliot. And, you know, people always remark on Eliot's sort of, you know, anglicized St. Louis accent. But I loved it. There's, there was a delicacy to the music and the voice that put me inside the poem. And, you know, I was, what, 15 or something. Yeah. And I thought, this is really pretty amazing. But at the same time, I was a complete geeked out, total folk music nerd in every way. I got Sing Out Magazine, I got Broadside Magazine. I suddenly realized that all of the ballads that come over, all the child ballads that come over from England to Appalachia, and then everything that was on Joan Baez's first two albums, those ballads are the basis of English poetry. I mean, you open the Norton Anthology and it opens with the anonymous ballads, all these anonymous ballads. And so for me, music has always been a really crucial part of what I believe poetry is about. And it's the music of the poet's intelligence that actually persuades us. And if we experience the music of how a poet thinks through the language, then he or she has us. You present an image, you let the reader settle down briefly, and then you turn the poem, and then the, mm -hmm. the reader is searching for the next uh, landing, and then That's you turn great. the poem again. So you produce this, uh, this lyrical displacement, and at the end, the, the reader is uh, disoriented, but is, uh, is like happily busy or happily, happily drunk. Um, how do you balance the mm -hmm. placement and the displacement? Yeah, I want my poems really to have a sense of availability. I don't want them to feel obscure. But the th things that matter most to me have to do with conditions that are basically mysterious. That it's Poetry seems one of the few things that can really touch mystery. And what you're describing, I love lyrical displacement. I, I like the idea of the poem almost like a kaleidoscope where the barrel gets turned yeah. slightly. <laughs> and so the perspective is slightly different. A different angle of understanding on a certain psychological state or experience or dynamic. Is, uh, is humor also connected to this uh, multiplicity of angles? Yeah. Because there's, there's humor, even in your most like m metaphysical or yeah. transcendental poems, there is always this kind of um, angle. Or uh, it's almost as if you have to read a poem uh, in an oblique way, and there's always humor. In a piece of writing, there's suddenly a moment, a kind of gesture that the writer makes that tears open the fabric of the poem. <laughs> and, you, it, and it does a couple of things. It sort of startles the reader. Uh, it can be humor. It can be an aside directly mm -hmm. to the reader. It can be something that's this kind of lyrical displacement or disconnect. But it allows the reader to move into this kind of opening this aperture, this torn piece, and it creates a space for the reader. It's a really magical thing. Yeah. And suddenly the reader is no longer outside the piece, 
but drawn within. It's kind of a zeitgeist notion. I think people are understanding this. But for me, humor is one of the ways to do that, absolutely. Assembling the dissembling. The pieces so familiar and polished with disdain. Then Infanta calls, she's the producer, then Infanta calls to say she knows she's perfected the exterior for all these years. My cheekbones feel scoured and hard tonight. Jade and garnet stones sleeping on the black and white tray at the bedside, polished with disdain. In this light, it's impossible to know if I have a face anymore or simply the moonlit mask of a face, flesh of bread, flesh of murder, flesh of winter, flesh of wine. I think I'll take a walk by the river tomorrow, listen in a bit at my old university and then there's a quote. My ambition here is the collapsing of several languages upon one another, all the while subtracting the narrative armature until only the activated field of the implied narrative remains. Wow, that was really a cool lecture. Remind me again why any of us gives a shit. Okay, thank you. I find that some of your poems work as decoders. Mm -hmm. uh, like, it's almost like they give you a key to open the rest mm -hmm. of the book or the rest of the work. Right. For example, um, the iris or the mm -hmm. ash tree, Fresno, yeah. or the broken gauges. I think that's true. I think that they're real, uh, though they're different, they represent clear paradigms of how I work a poem, how I write a poem. I think Iris especially. Do you mind reading Iris? No, not <laughs> at all. My grandmother had died and she was a really important person for me. She had this extraordinary two-acre landscaped garden. You know, when she bought the land, it was all fig stumps. It's an, an area of Fresno called the Fig Garden Village. I said, um, wow, uh, what did you do to get the fig stumps out? Did you hire somebody with a tractor you know, to pull them out? And she said, oh, no, no, dynamite. I said, dynamite? I said, you mean you had somebody come in and dynamite all of these stumps? She looked at me and she said, why would I hire someone to do that? You get a sense of what a formidable woman mm -hmm. she was. So the prize of her garden were her iris beds. And as epigraph to the poem, her name, Vivian St. John, and dates, 1891-1974, are given. There is a train inside this iris. You think I'm crazy and like to say boyish and outrageous things. No. There is a train inside this iris. It's a child's finger bearded in black banners, a single window like a child's nail, a darkened porthole lit by the white angular face of an old woman, or perhaps the boy beside her in the stuffy hot compartment. Her hair is silver and sweeps back off her forehead onto her cold and bruised shoulders. The prairies fail along Chicago, past the five lakes, into the black woods of her New York. And as I bend close above the iris, I see the train drive deep into the damp heart of its stem, and the gravel of the garden path 
cracks under my feet as I walk this long corridor of elms, arched like the ceiling of a French railway pier, where a boy with pale curls holding a fresh iris is waving goodbye to a grandmother, gazing a long time into the flower, as if he were looking some great distance or down an empty garden path, and he believes a man is walking toward him, working dull shears in one hand. And now, believe me, the train is gone. The old woman is dead, and the boy. The iris curls on its stalk in the shade of those elms, where something like the icy and bitter fragrance in the wake of a woman who's just swept past you on her way home, and you remain. Thank you. When you read a poet, a good poet, you mm -hmm. read all the poets you had read before. Absolutely. And uh, when I was reading uh, your work, I was reading, of course, in my own uh, Spanish tradition, I was reading uh, Vicente Alexandre sure. and uh, Antonio Ramoneda. Yeah. And I was thinking, uh, if I was thinking if you uh, have been told the, the connection or possible connection between the way you write and Alexandre's work. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that it's so, mm -hmm. it's so great that you sense that. What you have to remember is I was a student of Philip Levine. And those poets, the Spanish poets, were the most important poets to him in all of his work. So I came of age as an undergraduate reading those poets. Okay. <laughs> reading, you know, Hardy St. Martin's translations in English, um, who is a friend of Levine's. Levine himself was translating from the Spanish. Um, I translated Blas de Otero. Yeah, Blas de Otero, yes. Yeah. And so uh, it's so, I don't know if anyone's ever seen that before, Mariano, but during those years, the five years I worked with Levine, those poems were all around me. Uh, also, this was the time that Robert Bly was beginning in Beacon Press, uh, was beginning to publish, you know, Jimenez, you know, okay. all different translations by Bly and James Wright from the Spanish. Um, and I took a translation class that was taught by Levine and a man, a wonderful man named Jose El Goriaga, and we worked with Spanish poets. And so that was, uh, that was a deep part mm. of my poetic coming of age. Yeah. You are uh, the co-editor of the American Hybrid uh, Norton Anthology of, mm -hmm. of New Poetry. And the premise in this um, anthology is that the division between experimental and traditional uh, styles is disappearing in American poetry in favor of a hybrid approaches mm -hmm. that blend trends from accessible lyricism to linguistic exploration. Mm -hmm. I would like you to apply your radar for styles, mm -hmm. so your radar for uh, trends, yeah. if you could apply that radar to the, uh, the poetry landscape of Los Angeles. What do you see? Do you see trends? Mm -hmm. Do you see groups, styles? Well, Los Angeles is so fascinating to me because one of the, f I think the second uh, journal that ever published my poems, it may have been the first, was a magazine called Baki that was put out by Papa Bach Bookstore. And the editor was Bill Moore. I mean, I didn't know Bill, but you know, I just saw this magazine. I was like, this is a great magazine. I sent him some poems. You know. And in some real way, I mean, I was in California, I was in Fresno at the time. And then I sent to the magazine called Trans Pacific, which was a wonderful early magazine. And then when uh, 
the anthology Stand Up Poetry came out. It was one of the first you know, early anthologies of Los Angeles poetry that I got. I almost felt really connected, even though I went from Fresno to Iowa City, then to Oberlin to Johns Hopkins. It, there was always this sense of, I kind of knew what was going on. And Beyond Baroque was the kind of way that I knew. I sort of kept track of things through Beyond Baroque. Uh, and so to now live like three or four blocks from Beyond Baroque <laughs> is kind of you know fabulous, this fabulous circle. One of the things that I love about the landscape of Los Angeles poetry is how variegated it is, how viscous and protean and changing. I love that stylistically people try a really wide variety of things. Again, there's a sense of permission. Mm. There's a sense of inclusiveness that I really love and admire. The other thing about Los Angeles poetry is, and I think this series of interviews and all of the tapes that uh, Wayne and Hilda have made, I mean, you look, it's, it's a documentation of this quite dazzling, eclectic representation of what's possible in poetry stylistically, um, in terms of philosophical, and even... And the delivery. And the delivery. And that's the whole, you know, when Charles Harper Webb did stand-up poetry, it was all about the performance. So th how the performative becomes a central part of poetry in Los Angeles. I mean, certainly then it, it was also happening in New York. But then suddenly we get in Chicago, you know, Patricia Smith, and you know, she's one of the founders of Poetry Slams in Chicago and all those things. I mean, she's one of many, but she's one whose poems I love mm. and sort of come out of that tradition. Um, but that was all happening here, all along. You know, I mean, it's like people forget that it was happening in Los Angeles in the 60s. To close the interview, do you want to read one last mm -hmm. poem? Sure. We could read either from these songs or... I was thinking about the last poem also in the Auroras. Oh, poem. let's do that because that's um, the final poem in this. The Auroras, as you know, is all about the speaker's growing sense of mortality. And this final aurora, the twelfth aurora, is called Dark Aurora. This is one of the ones where I wanted that element of humor. You were talking about, mm -hmm. you know, if I'm going to talk about my own death, I better be funny. <laughs> <laughs> what a beautiful letter you wrote to me. It was as ripe as a planet and as much to the point. It was filled, I saw, not with revelations or expectations. It was a space that expanded like space. All I could do was respond with the poor reflex of intellect, which is to say the insufficiency of a hedgehog and the modest vocabulary of a saint. Darkness, darkness. What unfolds, folds out away from me. If death has a form, it is the form of departure. If death has a form, it is lit by darkness. Everything we've looked for all these years, everything together we've called some necessity of invention, any syllable and symbol, every penetrating 
and luminous or prodigious desire, every carved line on every page has emptied into this flesh, this flash of revelation, this form which is no memory, which is our dark, the form of dark and darkness in its final form. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.